never particularly cared for soccer. Uh, maybe that's just because I'm a dumb American and I just don't see the appeal in the game. But it's never really been my thing. Never was that interested in it. I've watched it a few times, gotten into it a few times, like when our you know U.S. women's soccer team did really well at, at various points. But um, I never was like a major hardcore fan of soccer. It just didn't uh, appeal to me. Um, there were certain aspects of the game that didn't make much sense. My, my biggest issue with it, why does the clock count up? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's uh, and very hard for, I, I think personally, very uh, hard for first-time viewers because they don't know when the clock is supposed to stop, <laughs> if it's counting up. And I think that's kind of a problem. And um, you know, I don't think the action is that interesting. I just don't, I, I just never cared for it. And again, if you love it, that's cool. That's your thing. That's awesome. Not everybody likes American football, and that to me is like the greatest game ever played. So, um, yeah, again, that's probably just me being too American. But uh, soccer, European football, never really my thing. My thoughts on that movie are coming very soon. I'm going to talk about it in great detail in my final video of the year. Um, I've got a lot to say about the Gareth Edwards Godzilla movie, and uh, I'm going to dedicate a portion of my final video to that. So I hate to not answer your question now, but trust me, I'm going to get into that uh, in a future video. So stay tuned. I don't really like the NBA, and I know that sounds horrible, <laughs> but... Um, NBA, I never was a huge fan of it. When I was a younger, I was kind of a Chicago Bulls fan. I was kind of a Charlotte Hornets fan, but that's I, that's kind of faded away now. Personally, as far as basketball goes, I do prefer college ball. Um, I root for Wake Forest because that was my dad's alma mater, so we're kind of a Wake Forest family, um, even though I didn't go there. Um, and so, yeah, I root for them, and I really get excited for March Madness, but for some reason, pro basketball just doesn't really do it for me. I don't even have an answer why. I just think college ball is more interesting. Breaking Bad ranks very high for me as one of my all-time favorite shows. It is, uh, uh, it's just a fucking great show. And I'm going to talk about it in a little bit of detail here, so there will be some spoilers. So if you haven't seen Breaking Bad and you don't want to have it spoiled for you, stop watching now because uh, they will be spoilers. So um, basically, if you look at, a, if I did a list of my all-time favorite TV shows, most of them would be comedies. Uh, the Simpsons when they were good. Seinfeld. Everybody loves Raymond. I seem to be the only one that really loves that show, but that's... Dude, that was my fucking family, so I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> that show's fucking funny. Um, South Park. Um, you know, The Muppet Show. Again, I, I fucking love puppets. Leave me alone. Um, All-time favorites. You know, The Critic was a favorite of mine, and it always... Uh, th that's a crime that that show got canceled. Uh, so basically my point is... Um, most of my favorite shows of all time are comedies. All in the family. Uh, that might be my number one. Um, not many dramas, and I think the reason for that is that a lot of serialized dramas will start off really good, and um, uh, they'll keep trucking along for maybe a season or two or three, and then they just fall to shit. Uh, Dexter is a glaring example of that. Started off great and then just turned to shit. Or, in some cases, they'll do really good, and then you get to the finale, and the finale kind of sucks, and it's like, it kind of ruins the whole experience. And comedies kind of get away with jumping the shark, you know, because um, comedies don't really, don't usually have like a long-running story arc or anything like that, so once the show stops being good, you can pretty much just, you know, you know where the cutoff point is when to stop watching, and you can just pretty much enjoy everything that came before the cutoff point. Um, but with serialized dramas, because it's an ongoing story arc, if the setup's really good and the build-up's really good, but the payoff sucks, it kind of ruins the appeal of the setup and the build-up. Um, it's kind of the you know the thing with movies where uh, so many movie franchises fuck up at the third film, like uh, Pirates Three did, for example. Um, it kind of ruins the whole experience if the the payoff uh, sucks to high heaven. Um, Breaking Bad did not have that problem. Breaking Bad, uh, first of all, smartest thing they ever did, I think, was ending the show when they did. Because I think it was just starting to get to that point where it was like, alright, we need to start doing some of the big payoffs here. Like, Hank has to find out that Walt is Heisenberg at some point. I mean, it's... And it was getting to that point where it was like, okay, because how many times can Hank keep getting away with it? 
Or, or, I mean, how, Walt. How many times can Walt keep getting away with it? How many times can he keep fooling Hank? How many times can he make a bad deal with a drug dealer and get away with it unscathed? Um, the, some serious shit was going to have to hit the fan. And uh, this last string of episodes they did to close up the series was fantastic. And uh, really turned out very, very well. The writing in the show is great. The characters are great. Um... The drama is great. Gus was such a great villain and really drove the stories very well um, and created a lot of the uh, the best tense moments I've ever seen in a television show. Uh, Brian Cranston as Walter White is one of the best acting performances I've ever seen because here's a guy that does all these horrible things. He kills people. He cooks meth. He goes from being this mild-mannered school teacher to being a meth cook. And ultimately a drug, you know, the leader of a drug empire. But he feels like this full range of emotions from love for his family and, uh, you know, pain and suffering and uh, hate and anger. And uh, just this wide range of emotions with one character. And it was such a brilliant performance by a guy who, uh, before this show, was typically associated with comedy. So it really demonstrated great range from a great performer. And, uh, uh, God, what else... Is there to really talk about? And he's a really unique setup in showing how a relatively respectable, mild-mannered person can kind of be tempted into the dark side and doing things that he normally wouldn't do. So uh, I think Breaking Bad is a fantastic show. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's, it's absolutely great. That is a heavy question, dude, that to, you know, I think I speak for most Americans that lived through that time, that, uh, that's not a day that we like to remember, but, uh, what happened to me on that day, where I was, was so eerie. Um, I, first of all, I was going to high school in D.C. at the time, so you can imagine how we reacted when we heard that the Pentagon had been hit. Um, we didn't react too well to that, obviously. Um, but... It was so eerie that day because we had just gone back to school. And I went to a Catholic school. So, you know, part of going to a Catholic school is that every now and then you got to go to a school mass. And we had the start of the year school mass. And um, all of this was going down. The towers had already been hit. The Pentagon had already been hit. And we knew nothing. Um, and this was before everybody had smartphones. So, um, you know, the, there weren't any whispers or murmurs, or if there were, I didn't hear it. So uh, we got to the Mass. The priest said, the Mass has ended. Go now and love and serve the Lord, and peace be with you, and all that stuff. And then the president of the school gets up and tells us what happened, and it's it's so eerie and so, like, it, and it felt like time had just stood still. And to have it, you know, to have that news delivered to you right after... Uh, going to Mass, which, you know, preaches messages about love and, uh, you know, community and, uh, and love and peace and community and all that stuff. To get hit with that news right after uh, sitting through a Mass is, was really a surreal experience. And then uh, um, we didn't really know how to react until we got back to the classrooms and started seeing the, the news footage. And it was like, oh my God, this actually happened. Like... Um, yeah, so that was not, uh, not a fun day, obviously, but just the circumstances of how I first heard the news is something I'll never forget, because it was, again, it was just such a weird, uh, ju juxtaposition, I guess, I don't know, to, uh, you know, just go through a religious service, <laughs> preaching messages of love and peace, and then get hit with the news that our nation was under attack. It was, it was very surreal. Oh, man. Uh, God, I hate to say it, but wrestling fans might be the worst that I've ever encountered. And I'm not saying that I'm the most sociable, most awesome person ever, but, uh, you know, I've been around Star Wars fans. I've been around Star Trek fans. Uh, I've been to comic book conventions and things like that. And you get your uber nerds, but something about wrestling fans, I don't know. Like, the bad ones. You know, what I, you, and you know which ones I'm talking about. The, the bad ones. Like, the really bad... Don't bathe, uh, you know, so they smell really bad and really not sociable, um, kind of annoying. I, I, I'm not even sure how to describe it, but when I went to the McFoley book signing a few years ago, 
Uh, you knew who the normal people were, and you knew who the weirdos were. And um, wrestling attracts some interesting weirdos. Um, I mean, it still floors me that there are still people out there that don't know it's fake. <laughs> it still like just floors my mind that you get those people that totally buy into the the act uh, even in this day and age. But um, God, I'm trying to think of a worse one. But I think wrestling fans might be the worst. And again, I'm not saying that about any of you. Um, you but if you've been to any kind of wrestling event or convention or anything, you know who the bad fans are, and you know who I'm talking about. So. Um, yeah, they tend to be kind of the worst, though. And I, I hate to say that, but it, it's true. I tried playing fantasy football for one season, and it nearly drove me insane. Um, and I didn't do too badly. It was just that, um, I, I take football very seriously, to the point that I, I seem like a fanatic uh, psychopath. Uh, if you watched a football game with me, you would probably want to leave the room because I yell and scream and shout and everything else. And between having to follow the Giants and every other team in the NFC East, of course now, I mean, that's pretty much done because the Giants, their season was done by week two. But um, if it's competitive and, uh, you know, there's still something for the Giants to fight for, I get super invested in it. And I have to pay attention to all the other teams in the division just to see how they do. Um... Now, you throw fantasy football on top of that, all that stress, all that anxiety, and all that just craziness. Now I have to follow every game that I have a guy on my fantasy team on and make sure I keep up with his stats. And I got kind of competitive, too, and it just drove me insane uh, when guys I put on my fantasy didn't deliver or I would uh, just hoping that this guy would score a touchdown and get this amount of yards so I could win this game and blah, blah, blah. And it just drove me crazy. Uh, I think fantasy football is brilliant, but I don't think I have the right temperament or um, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm thinking? Well, temperament. We'll just go with that uh, for fantasy football. I just take the game way too fucking seriously to play it um, and stay a normal, sane person uh, while going through the whole, uh, the whole ordeal. I'd never heard of the guy until you asked the question, so before I filmed this part of the video, I decided to check out a couple of his videos, and uh, he seems like a pretty good guy, so he got a new subscriber because of you, so uh, good job, man. My favorite movies that I saw this year were The World's End, which was uh, the third part of the Cornetto trilogy, uh, following... Uh, you know, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, and loved it, thought it was really funny, had all the same great, you know, the snippy dialogue, the great effortless uh, energy that, you know, those movies seem to have. Edgar Wright, Sean Pegg, and Nick Frost, I mean, they do good work, and uh, that was a really, 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 really good movie. The only bad thing I can say about it is that it wasn't as good as Shaun of the Dead or Hot Fuzz. Oh no, two of the best comedies ever made, it wasn't as good as those two. Oh no, it's the weakest one in the Cornetto trilogy. That's kind of like being the worst beetle. <laughs> Almost. I mean, it's like, oh no. <laughs> oh darn. Um, didn't live up to, to, you know, the absolute perfect awesomeness. It's only near perfect. Um, and the other movie I really liked this year was Pacific Rim. And that's only because I grew up a big giant monster movie nerd. And I grew up with Voltron and Power Rangers and shit like that. So... Uh, if you're, you know, if you were like me and you watched Godzilla, Voltron, and Power Rangers a lot as a kid, you're probably going to like Pacific Rim, because it's like Guillermo del Toro traveled back in time and talked to my six-year-old self, and he's like, son, what would you like to see as a movie? And I'd be like, well, I'd like to see, um, giant monsters destroying cities, and then giant robots showing up to fight them. I'm going to make that into a movie just for you. And, uh, so my inner child was thoroughly thrilled with, uh... The end result of Pacific Rim. Just great, great shit. Perfect nerd uh, type of movie. The worst movies this year are movies I didn't even see, but I don't need to see them to know that they're bad. Scary Movie 5, Movie 43, and Inappropriate Comedy. And uh, I heard the Seltzer and Freeburg crew made a Hunger Games parody called The Starving Games. I'm like, fuck them. God damn it. <laughs> I saw no previews for it, but I heard they made it. And it's just like, ah, fuck. But... You know, it's really disheartening to me when I see such low-ball, low-class... Oh, and we'll throw Grown Ups 2 in there just so I can bash Adam Sandler. Um, 
but just really low class, low quality, no effort uh, comedies. Um, and to me, comedies should be the easiest type of movie to make. I, with, when it comes to comedy, I'm willing to forgive bad acting. I am willing to forgive bad uh, stories, like you know, plot holes and whatever. Perfect example is Liar Liar. The story of that movie makes no sense. Uh, how did all that happen in one day? I don't know. But you know what? It was funny, and I will forgive it if it's funny. And to me, the scenes in the courtroom in Liar Liar are some of the funniest things I've ever seen. So, fuck. I, like, that movie gets a pass for uh, plot holes or whatever. Um, actually, if I were rewriting Liar Liar, I would make it so that the entire movie was in the courtroom, because uh, I think that would be really funny to, to do that. But, um, but yeah, I'm willing to forgive a lot with the comedy as long as it's funny. When I see Adam Sandler film... You know, basically film him and his friends going out on vacation and then trying to sell that as a movie. Or I see movie 43, which is a sketch movie, and it's just, it just looks bad from the trailers. And it's just a bunch of one, you know, one note jokes that they stretch out forever and ever. Um, when I see these awful, uh, uncreative parody movies that continue to make money and continue to be made for whatever goddamn reason. Um, it makes me sad, because it's like, just lowest common denominator bullshit as, at its absolute worst. And it's gotten to where it's like, look, I don't even need to see the movies to know that they're crap. And it's, because it's the same thing as epic movies, the same thing as disaster movie. Disaster movie might be one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It's up there. Like, Garbage Pail Kids is the worst I've ever seen. Disaster movie isn't far behind. So, uh... Yeah, and the fact that those type of movies are still being made, and there's still an audience for these movies, just baffles my mind. Um, uh, I, I just, I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't understand it, don't get it. Um, but uh, I guess as long as there's an audience for it, you know, these low-caliber comedies are still gonna, still gonna be made. And it's sad, really, because I grew up with Mel Brooks, and he was the king of uh, movie parodies. And... The art of movie parodies has been destroyed, and then you got, uh, you know, group ensemble casts. Those are being destroyed by Adam Sandler's efforts. Um, it, it's just depressing. It's really depressing. Because, like I said, comedy, all you have to do is be funny. And I'll forgive almost anything. And these movies can't even do that right. So, whatever. I think she's awful at what she does. She can't sing, can't dance. Her music is terrible. And I hate the fact that a person becomes famous for being a hot mess. She goes out on the VMAs, does that whole thing, and that makes her more famous than ever. And it's like we're going to basically reward her with attention and praise for being awful. Fine. Whatever. I guess that's the way society works. I mean, this, I mean, we're the same society that made Charlie Sheen even bigger than he was before when he was acting like a complete psychopath. So, okay, fine. That's just the way uh, celebrities, you know, celebrity fame works now. Okay, sure. I've never been a huge anime fan. Um, not that I have anything against it, but stylistically it just wasn't always uh, super appealing to me. And there were a lot of animes that my friends tried to get me into that just made no sense to me. Uh, I remember one where a bunch of people fell into a magic river and they turned into panda bears or something, and I was like, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I just, I don't get what I'm seeing right now. Um, a lot of like the kitty ones, like Digimon and Pokemon and stuff like that, never appealed to me. Uh, to me, Pokemon, and I've said this before, but Pokemon to me, the show. Okay, I understand the video games, even though I never played them, and I understand the card games because, um, again, never played them, but I understand them because there's like a um, there's an appeal there and a bunch of different creatures and they can be fun to play and whatever. Okay, that's fine. I never understood the TV show because to me it's like they took Snarf from Thundercats and made about 150 of them and made a show around it and that's it. <laughs> and it's like, I don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. Um, to me it was just, I watched one episode of it. It was the most obnoxious thing I've ever watched in my life. Uh, there was another one, um... Where I, they, my friends had me watch the last episode, which is probably why I didn't get it. But um, Isaac Newton was the bad guy, and there were cat people. I think, I want to say the name was Escaflone. I want to say that was the name of the show, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I just walked away from it. I was like, I have no idea what the fuck I just watched. 
it just didn't make any sense to me. However, there are animes that I have watched um, outside of Dragon Ball. I've talked about Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z a lot, and I've seen... I, I think I've seen all of DBZ. If not, I'm sure I've seen most of it. Um, Dragon Ball, I've seen at least half of it. So, uh, But other than that, I've seen Cowboy Bebop, which is great. I loved it. Um, uh, stylistically, it was just great. And, uh, you know, action-packed, great characters, uh, great action, just everything. I just loved it. Um, Trigun, I really liked. Everything was great. I loved the setup. I loved the world. I loved the characters. I did not like the finale, and that was a problem. And I couldn't quite figure out why, and I think the problem was I didn't like the main villain, and I think that was the problem. I think he was overshadowed by Legato, who was a much better villain and <laughs> far more interesting, and he was the top henchman, so when you get to the main guy, uh, Legato was such this evil presence that when I was like, oh my god, when, he, when Vash goes up against the main bad guy, it's going to be, oh my god, he's going to be like the personification of evil. And he was just kind of, uh, he's just his twin. It was just, eh, it's kind of boring, and I don't really care. It's, I think Legato kind of stole uh, the the thunder of the main villain, and uh, I, I don't even remember his name. But I loved Wolfwood. I loved Vash. I loved the two uh, insurance girls that were following them on this wacky adventure. I loved kind of the western uh, setup they had going. So that was a really good anime, even though I I didn't much care for the finale. Um, what else have I watched? Um. My sister tried to get me into some... She's big into... My sister is a way bigger anime fan than I am. Um, she tried to get me into Gundam Wing. I, I watched a couple episodes and I was like, I have no idea what's going on and it's kind of boring. Um, she loves Sailor Moon to death. Uh, that was for Sailor Moon was to her what Power Rangers was to me, which is, which is fine, but I, I never really liked it. Um, she tried to get me into Roroni Kenshin. That was another one. I never watched it. Uh... Again, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, one that I did watch and actually really liked. And this one surprises people when I tell them that I've watched this anime from start to finish. Excel Saga. Um, because most of the other ones, like, okay, Cowboy Bebop, Trigun, Dragon Ball, very accessible. I mean, all of them were on Cartoon Network, either on Adult Swim or on their Toonami block. Um, so when I tell people that I've seen Excel Saga, they're like, how have you... You're not a big anime fan, so how do you know about that one? That was one that my sister introduced me to, and she's like, Patrick, trust me, you will like this one because it's so weird and wacky and silly and comedic that you will like it. And <laughs> I have to admit that I did really like it. It's, I think it's really funny. Um, and it's just so weird, and the main character is so... I'm not even sure. She's so excited and crazy and animated that I just fell in love with her. I just think she's great. So um, I actually like the first half of the show a lot more than the second half. The second half actually has a story arc. And I'm like, what? what there's a story now? When, when did we get into a story? <laughs> you know, I, I just like the more parody focus uh, that they were doing earlier in the show. But um, I think that show is really funny and I really like it. But um, obviously as a kid, I also grew up with Voltron and that counts, right? Um, again, that's another highly accessible one that I watched. So, uh, yeah, that's about all my experiences with anime. Again, not a huge fan, but um, I've never seen Evangelion. I heard that Pacific Rim um, ripped it off a lot. <laughs> that's what I've been told. I uh, never saw Evangelion, and people have told me that I would like that one too because it's like, dude, you like giant monsters, you like giant robots. I think you're going to like this one. So uh, maybe one day I'll check out Evangelion. But um, other than that, that's all my experiences with anime. Speaking as a Giants fan, I have the utmost respect for Tom Coughlin as a head coach. Um, I was happy when they first signed him. Uh, we struggled for a bit early on, but eventually it led to uh, great things. I thought uh, his style and his approach to the game was exactly what the Giants needed. Um, and, you know, say whatever you want, two Super Bowls to show for it. Um, no other coach in Giants history can say that except for the great Bill Parcells. So, uh, to me, Tom Coughlin, his whole run with the Giants has been wildly successful just for that alone. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take those two Super Bowls to the grave with me. Those are just uh, two wonderful uh, moments in my uh, history of being a Giants fan. Um, if it were up to me, um, the way this season has gone down, starting 0-6 and, and just be basically our season was done by week two or three, um, if it were up to me, I would be tempted to let Tom stay on another year because just out of respect for what he's done for the organization. 
Um, they might do that. The Marrows and the Tishes might do that. I don't know. Personally, I, I don't... I wouldn't be surprised if they let him go. And if this is the end of the Tom Coughlin era with the New York Giants, um, you know, he had a good run. Uh, he had a really good run. Two Super Bowls. I'll take it. Um... And, uh, you know, and no matter what happens, uh, that won't change my opinion of Tom Coughlin as a coach and how happy I ha I've been with him as the head coach of the New York Giants. So uh, whatever happens, uh, I will always respect Tom Coughlin. Uh, and I'm happy that the Giants have had him. My first year doing videos, I think uh, I remember posting a list of my 20 or 30 favorite uh, Christmas specials and movies. Um, but I'll go ahead and post a revised list here because, you know, things change and things. Uh, I've discovered some new Christmas specials since then. So, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and post that list. But my number one favorite is uh, Christmas Carol. Which version? Um, I love the Aleister Sim version. I love the George C. Scott version. And because I'm a kid at heart, I love the Mickey Mouse version, which brilliantly told the entire story in like half an hour and was really well done. Um, and the Muppet version, gotta love that too. So uh, I just love the whole story of this grump, uh, you know, not being able to get into the Christmas spirit and getting, um, kind of rediscovering uh, his appreciation for life and the people around him. And uh, it's really an uplifting story and I really like it. So uh, that's always been one of my favorites. And it's a pure classic. You've seen dozens of versions of it and even the bad versions have the magic the, the weight of the story and um the great character of ebenezer scrooge to follow and everything like that so um yeah i really love uh, a christmas carol but there's that list my top 30 favorite christmas movies and specials go I liked I Am Legend. I thought that was a really cool movie. Uh, because I grew up in the 90s, I gotta say Independence Day, even though that movie's not technically a good movie, but it is an awesome movie. It's one of those guilty pleasure films that is so epic uh, in how goofy and silly it is. But uh, yeah, I do enjoy Independence Day. But my number one favorite Will Smith movie is Men in Black, which I've described it as the Ghostbusters of the 90s. It's just a really great movie imaginative setup, great world, great characters playing off of each other, and Will Smith is fantastic in it, so, um, yeah, Men in Black is my absolute favorite he, that he was ever in. More Breaking Bad spoilers here, so don't watch if you don't want to be spoiled and you haven't seen the show yet. Um, my favorite Breaking Bad character is Walter White, because he's just so fascinating and so complex. It's really great to watch the entire show and just see how somebody can go from a, you know, respectable member of society, teacher, father, you know, husband, all that stuff, and turn into a drug kingpin. Um, that is really fascinating to watch and to see him devolve into a mild-mannered man, into really a monster, but still feel this full range of emotions, um you know, uh, through all of his experiences and his interactions with the people in this world, uh, in both worlds, both his personal life and his, I guess we'll call it his professional life. Um, and he's, again, Brian Cranston did such an amazing job bringing that character to life that um, it's, uh, yeah, Walter has to be my favorite. Now, I'm not a Walt sympathizer, and I want to, want to make that clear. Um, I did not feel sorry for him, for him, especially as the show got into its later stages. Um, yes, he got lung cancer, and that's why he did what he did. That's understandable. But it does, it's, you know, he almost uses it as a justification to do more and more terrible things, like uh, letting Jane die, and poisoning Brock, and, um, you know, killing Gale. Or, hey, he has Jesse kill Gale. Um, all of these things that he does, he kills Mike. He kills all the members in prison just so he doesn't get outed. Um... You know, just over and over and over and over again. And he just keeps getting worse and worse. It's like a snowball. And he drags everybody else down with him. 
Um, and it's, uh, so I don't really feel sorry for him. And personally, by the end of the show, he's left in a cabin um, in the middle of nowhere with millions of dollars that he can't spend with no interaction uh, with any kind of human being and no contact with the outside world. That to me, and, and of course he's slowly dying because of his cancer, that to me was the ending that he earned for himself. I felt like after what you did to your family and the position that you left them in, after all the things that you did to everybody else, it's kind of like, yeah, you that's the ending you deserve for yourself. And the finale to me, uh, and this was how I would have approached the finale, and I was glad that this is how they did it. It was him kind of making up for what he did. It's like, um, he can't fully atone for what he did, but um, at least the people he hurt, he left them in a better position than he did um, beforehand. He saved Jesse. He, uh, you know, got the money to his family um, in a way that they wouldn't uh, be able to figure out. He made up with Skylar. And all of that stuff. So, um, but yeah, Walter White is the best written character on the show, without question. Uh, other characters I like, uh, Skylar was very frustrating because it was like, when she pulled the knife on Walt at the end, or in Ozymandias, I actually applauded because, like, finally, the bitch stood up for herself. <laughs> But, I mean, when she helped Walt film that video to implicate Hank in the drug dealing, I was like, wow, you're a fucking bitch. I don't like you. But <laughs> um, she made up for it uh, when she... Uh, I, like, I really, I seriously applauded when she pulled the knife on Walt, because I was like, you need to get that son of a bitch out of your house. <laughs> um, and that is one of the best moments in the entire show to me, just for its tenseness and the, uh, you know, just the sheer intensity of everything that was going on. But, uh, other characters I love, I love Jesse Pinkman. Um, he's the most tragic character on the show, I think. And I think most of us know somebody like that. At heart, he's a good person, but he just always makes bad decisions and keeps screwing his own life up. And he just can't get his life right. And by the end of the show, he, he was in such a bad place and so many bad things had happened to him. And he would suffered so much that I was kind of like, look, just put a bullet in his head and, and let his miserable life be over. I felt so bad for him. I was like, please just kill him. Because he, 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 just so he doesn't have to suffer anymore. Um, I like that his story was open-ended at the end of the show. You don't know how he's going to turn up. He just drives off into the night and you don't know what he's, what's going to be come of him or what but he suffered so much that i felt like he deserved a second chance of life and whatever he does with that second chance is completely up to him and it's up to the audience's interpretation i don't know where jesse's going i don't know what he's ultimately going to turn his life into but i wanted him to get that second chance of life and hopefully he makes the right decisions uh to give himself a better life going forward um but again, that's all open to interpretation. Um, and I love Walt Jr. And for reasons I don't really want to get into, I always have like a personal connection with handicapped characters. Um, and Walt Jr. to me um, was very endearing and really the most purely good character on the show. And the most, um, you know, because everybody else has a secret to hide or everybody else has a vice or something. Um... Walt Jr. didn't. He was a normal teenager. He could be selfish. He could be a bit of a brat at times. But at the end of the day, um, he was the most purely good character on the show. And when he uh, pulled Walt off of Skyler, again, referencing Ozymandias, which I think is the best episode in the show, um, when he pulled Walt off of him and shielded his mother and called the cops, I was like, in that one move, uh, Walt Jr. did more to protect the family than Walt Sr. ever did. Because um, Walt Sr., you know, he really endangered his family through what he was doing and uh, ultimately put their lives at risk throughout the entire show. And a lot of the motivation for me rooting for Walt, Ju or Walt Sr. was like, I don't want his family to die because of his decisions. So... Um, again, highlighting how complex uh, Walter White is, but Walt Jr. was so purely good. And I, you know, I said when he made that phone call and he shielded his mother, I was like, he did more to protect the family than Walt uh, Sr. ever did. So I love Walt Jr. because he's so purely good. And I love Hank, too. I think Hank's great. And he went out like a boss, didn't he? Again, Ozymandias, best episode in the show. Um, again, he was a guy that, you know, had his surly attitude, had his bad moments, but overall... Um, stood by what was right and was very good at his job, very smart, and was a perfect opponent for Walter White throughout the show. They were, uh, it was a cat and mouse game throughout the entire show, but, uh, he didn't know that he was going after Walter, and, uh, I love that moment when he realizes that Walter White is Heisenberg, and he's sitting on the can reading a book, and, uh, he realizes that he's been had throughout the entire show. 
but yeah, I love Hank. He's a great character. But um, and then you have Gus. Gus is a great villain. I love him. He's uh, just the perfect bad guy to drive the stories along. And he, you want to talk about going out like a boss? His death might be one of the best deaths ever. Um, well, actually, you know what? Todd was a pretty awesome death, too, because I was so happy that Jesse got to kill him. Uh, <laughs> that made me extremely happy. I don't think I've ever cheered a death that loudly than when Jesse killed Todd, because I just wanted Jesse to have that. Um, I also love Mike. I think Mike's a great character. Mike, to me, is kind of what Walt, uh, thinks he is, or what Walt wishes he could be. Mike does the things that he does purely for his granddaughter, and is able to keep his personal life and his private, uh, his professional life and his private life separated and he's able to be the good grandfather while also going off and doing this thing and everything that he does is purely for his granddaughter to give her a nest egg uh to live off of whereas walt um you know he initially does it for the family but at the same time he has his very selfish motivations too which he admits in the final episode um but mike uh, uh yeah mike was great and i love the bond that he forms with jesse as well and uh that was another character death that i was really upset by when he ultimately died and uh but yeah those are my favorite characters walt's my favorite character because of just how brilliantly written he is but um i love all of those characters too breaking bad it's so much great writing and great characters in it that it's hard to pick just one but walt is my ultimate favorite When I was a kid, I was a John Elway fan, and because of that, I've always kind of a, had a bit of respect for the Denver Broncos. Um, another one is uh, the Green Bay Packers. I, to me, I look at them and I just see NFL history. They're NFL royalty and just old-school NFL. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for that franchise, uh, just for the history they have. And just, the, you know, I love Lambeau Field. Lambeau Field is like the last of the really great um, old-school football venues. And... Uh, but yeah, the Green Bay Packers and the Denver Broncos I've always had kind of a thing for. And the Washington Redskins, because I grew up in Washington, D.C., I won't say I'm a fan of theirs, but their fans have always been really cool to me, and we kind of have an understanding with my friends. as like, look, if it can't be us, I want your team to win it, because we don't want Philly and we don't want Dallas to win it. So it's like, of course, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it this year because both our teams are terrible, but um it's like we always kind of have that understanding it's like look i'm not going to root for your team and i'm i'm not going to root for yours you're not going to root for mine but we can all agree it's like as long as it's not philly or dallas we'll be okay so uh yeah so i've always had kind of an understanding with the washington redskins and uh that's kind of cool I haven't seen every episode of it, um, but I liked what I've seen. I've only seen, like, maybe 15 episodes in the entire show, and uh, it's really cool. I, you know, obviously I'm a horror fan, so uh, the show's really good at anything that kind of presents spooky stories and scary images and stuff like that I think is really cool. And I think Tales from the Crypt did a really good job of it, so, uh, yeah, I do like the show. South Park is still pretty awesome. That Game of Thrones parody they just got done with was pretty sweet. Um, other than that, I mean, I've been watching South Park for years, so other than that, I I still like The Big Bang Theory. It's not as good as it was a few years ago, but um, I still watch it, and you know, Sheldon Cooper still makes me laugh, so that's cool. But I think my number one favorite comedy right now is Archer. Uh, that show is fucking amazing. And you want to talk about a show that just was perfect right off the bat? That show won me over with its pilot episode, and that rarely ever happens, but the pilot was so good, with such great dialogue, such great characters. I was like, oh my god, I'm so gonna love this show. And the show's been fantastic. I just, uh, you know, love all the running gags. Danger Zone! Um, and just everything about it. I love the interactions between the characters. It really does sound like they're all in the sound booth playing off of each other, and it's, like, mostly improv, but it's not. They all film their lines one at a time, which, uh, really kind of surprised me. I was like, wow, because it really sounded like they were all in the same room, because just the way they play off of each other and the, the quick reactions and everything. So, uh, they do a really good job with that show and just the line delivery and everything. So, uh, yeah, I think Archer's fantastic. Last Airbender, for sure. I think that show was better balanced, much tighter writing, better writing, and just it kept getting better and better as the show progressed. Um, plus, I my favorite characters in Last Airbender and all of Avatar, quite honestly, were Zuko and Iroh, and they were what kept me coming back more than anything else, because I, I wanted to see what would become of them and what how their story was going to end up. Because, you know, Aang, Sokka, and Katara, and Toph, and they're all great. I love them all. 
but you kind of know that they're going to be okay. It's kind of like Harry Potter. You know that Harry, Ron, and Hermione are going to wind up okay. And uh, Last Airbender kind of had that same effect. It was like, all right, you know that the four main kids are going to be all right. Um, but Zuko and Iroh, you know, there was more mystery with them. It's like, is Uncle Iroh going to die? Is Zuko going to die? Um, are they going to turn... Well, I mean, I assumed from the start that they were going to turn good, ultimately, because they were just too likable uh, to not eventually have a face turn. But, um, you know, is, is, you know, is... How is Zuko going to redeem himself? Uh, what's Iroh going to do uh, once... Uh, you know, where are their loyalties ultimately going to lie? Their story and their relationship was ultimately more interesting to me than anything else in the show. In, in a very good show with many great things, it was their relationship and their story that was the most interesting to me and kept me coming back. And um, by, the sh by the time this show gets into seasons two and three, it's fantastic. It's just flawless. Legend of Korra, um, season one was great. Great villain, tight writing, great setup. Great changes to separate it from the original show. Very good. Um, you know, there were a couple mistakes here and there, but overall it's very good. Season 2 had some great moments. Um, and the ending, the finale was great, and where everything ends up is great. It's kind of a bumpy road getting there. So the writing was a little sloppy and nowhere near as tight as it had been in Season 1 or in uh, the, the three seasons of Last Airbender. Um... And, again, the finale was good enough to where I kind of see where they were going with it. And I was like, okay. Um, I, I like where they ended up, but getting there was kind of a rocky road. Um, uh, the villain was boring as hell. Unalak, whatever his name was, he was boring as fuck. <laughs> and by far the weakest villain in all of Avatar. I mean, when you look at the villains we had, like, Zuko started off as a villain. He was awesome. Commander Zhao was awesome. Uh, Azula was fantastic. Lord uh, Fire Lord Ozai was great. Amon was fucking amazing uh, in season one of Korra. And then you get to this boring piece of blah, <laughs> Unalak, and I just I just didn't care about him at all whatsoever. And if you have a, a boring villain, that tends to hurt the, the overall story. That was actually my major problem with Thor: The Dark World. Is like not a bad movie, but that villain was boring as hell. But um, yeah, uh, Korra Season 2 was a bit of a bumpy road. Um, although it did have some really good stuff, like the origins of how the Avatar was first created, and like I said, the finale was good, and things like that. But then a lot of the other subplots ultimately went nowhere. Um, they revisited the love triangle, which was stupid. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think Korra quite has the same balance and tightness that the original show did. So obviously I'm going to lean towards the original show as being the better one. I have to be honest, I've never seen any of the Fast and Furious movies, so I don't really know what they're going to do without Paul Walker. It's sad that he passed away, and, you know, my best wishes go out to his friends and family, but uh, as far as what the series is ultimately going to become without him, I don't really know, because I've never seen any of the movies. You know, it's weird. I actually never quite got over some of my first crushes when I was a kid, like Amy Jo Johnson, who was the Pink Power Ranger, and Kelly Kapowski from Saved by the Bell, Tiffany Amber Thiessen, um, Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> I, I watched Labyrinth at four years old, and I absolutely fell in love with her. Now I look creepy because I'm, you know, in my late 20s, and uh, she was like 15 when she made that movie, so now me ogling her while watching Labyrinth would just make me sick. The Rocketeer, however, is perfectly okay. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you never quite get over your first crushes or whatever. Uh, Miss Elizabeth was also a big one. Um, but right now, my top celebrity crush, probably Jennifer Lawrence. And I've never seen The Hunger Games because I wanted to read the books first before I watched the movies. I hear they're really good. So, um, And I hear this last one that they just released was amazing. But um, she just seems like a really cool person. I saw her in X-Men First Class, obviously, and she was great in that. And uh, I saw her in Silver Lining playbook and she was great in that too she just seems like a really cool person i've seen her in interviews and stuff she's just really cool very charming very likable and obviously you know cute as a button so that also helps but uh yeah jennifer lawrence i, I think she's really awesome I don't want to give my exact information because, you know, don't want to get too personal, uh, of, you know, with what information you release on online and through your video blogs. But um, I will say I do live near Washington, D.C. I live in Maryland um, and, 
you know, from where I am, I'm probably a good 20 minutes away from D.C. So, uh, yeah, I'll give you a general idea of where I live. Well, this year he's in the bottom 10, but, uh, you know, so is the Giants team as a whole. Um, looking over his whole body of work, and typically, though, um, especially since he won the first Super Bowl and... Um, you know, kind of the resume he's built for himself since then. I wouldn't put him on the same level of his brother, and I wouldn't put him on the same level as Brady or, you know, Rodgers or Breeze or those guys. But he's probably, I would say he's the next step down. I wouldn't say he's in the top five, but um, I'd, I'd give him, you know, top ten at worst, top fifteen. Um, and yes, he has his mistakes where he throws his interceptions, and trust me, it's frustrating. But at the same time, you know, you never feel like the game's over as long as you have Eli Manning under center, and that's kind of a weird feeling, I know, but he's had some amazing comebacks in his day, so, um, and I, you know, overall, with, through all the good and the bad, the peaks and the valleys, um, <laughs> like I said about Coughlin, it's like, you know, with Eli, we won two Super Bowls, so I'll certainly take that, so as a Giants fan, I appreciate Eli greatly, but... Um, realistically speaking, I don't put him in, like, the super, super elite class of Brady or his brother, but, um, you know, like I said, I typically hold him in a fairly high regard. Reasonable expectations, of course, but, um, yeah, I'd say that's about right. I feel like Michael Jackson was a person that was never psychologically or emotionally able to handle the stress that came along with his fame. Um, and he was a guy that just, um, you know, very bizarre person, very eccentric person, uh, very odd. Um, obviously, there were the allegations that were brought up against him. Um, were they true? Were they not? I don't know. Um, what I will say is that I wouldn't be surprised if it was true. Uh, I can't say that it was definitively. Um, that's just, and I guess at this point we'll probably never know for sure, but, um, you know, all, uh, yeah, just a very odd person. That's basically, uh, and it's sad to think about that, uh, that, you know, the first thoughts that are in my head that go to Michael Jackson are, uh, just how odd and strange he was, but, you know, uh, uh, as a performer, he made damn good music, and this is coming from a guy who doesn't like pop music, but... Billy Jean, Thriller, Smooth Criminal, I, a motherfucker, he could do some work. Uh, great music, great dancer, great performer, bit of an oddball <laughs> as a person. To be perfectly honest, none. I think Breaking Bad is perfect the way it is. Uh, let the story stand on its own and you don't need any other material. I think it's... Uh, I don't think you need any spin-offs or any kind of continuation or anything. I think it's just fine the way it is. I've heard talks of a Saul Goodman spin-off, to which I'm like, eh, I'm not really excited to see it. I mean, I like Saul, but he was kind of the comedy relief of the show, and I'm not sure if that character's strong enough to carry his own show. And just the fact that I think Breaking Bad is just let the show stand for itself. I don't think it needs to have any kind of spin-off or anything. If there has to be one, I would make it about Jesse. Um, but that's just me. I, I would just, you know, it'd be interesting to see what they could come up with, um, uh, you know, following his escape from, uh, you know, the finale and just see where he ends up and what his life is like and what it's become and everything. But even that, I don't know if you can carry a whole show with it. That would just be an extended epilogue, really. Um, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Maybe, I, here's something they could do. Um, because apparently the blue meth, uh, that Walt cooked had a small appearance in an episode of The Walking Dead, so I was like, alright, why don't they do a crossover? Uh, like, or at least some of them a crossover where, like, Skyler and Walt Jr. and Jesse and, uh, pretty much anybody that, uh, is left over from Breaking Bad, they survive the zombie apocalypse and are put into the world of The Walking Dead. That'd be interesting. That doesn't sound fanficy at all. No, not at all. It's not not tripe or anything. No, no, sure. But um, uh, but yeah. But my personal opinion would be to just leave Breaking Bad alone. Do, do, don't do any spinoffs or anything. Just let the show speak for itself. Not a fan of that decision. Not a fan of that casting choice. And it's not that I hate Ben Affleck. 
Um, I, I realize that he has kind of a bad reputation with some people, and yeah, he was in some shitty movies like Geely and, uh, you know, Daredevil, but, um, he was also good in some other really good movies. He was in Chasing Amy, he was in good, he was very good in that. Um, he was in Argo, he wrote and directed that as well, I think. Uh, I think he wrote it, I'm not sure, I know he directed it. Uh, had the starring role in that and did very well in that. So it's not that he's a bad performer or anything, or, you know, doesn't have a good creative mind. Uh, he also directed The Town, um, which is also very good. Um, my problem with the decision is that I think Ben Affleck is just too distracting. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to look past Ben Affleck and see Batman. And that's, um, I think that's going to be the problem. The only thing I can really compare it to, in my mind, that, you know, makes sense to me. I remember when Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came out, and I don't know who made this decision, but the Frankenstein monster was played by Robert De Niro. And I love Robert De Niro as an actor. Goodfellas is one of my favorite movies ever. I love Robert De Niro. But no amount of makeup you put on him is going to make me see the Frankenstein monster. I'm just going to see Robert De Niro. You're taking an iconic character, putting an actor in the role that really clashes with the character, and it's just I'm not getting lost in the performance. It's just it's just too distracting that that big of a name and that recognizable of an actor is playing this iconic character. And, um, you know, I thought Robert De Niro as the Frankenstein monster was very distracting. And one of the most questionable casting decisions that I've, I've ever seen, quite honestly. Uh, again, I'm not putting down De Niro. I just think it was bad casting. Um, and Ben Affleck, I'm kind of worried that the same thing's going to happen. It's like, I'm not going to see Bruce Wayne. I'm not going to see Batman. I'm just going to see just Ben Affleck being Ben Affleck. And um, that's a problem. I wish they had gone the route of... Uh, Superman, the way they cast Superman, they cast a relative unknown and, um, you know, basically let him, ma let, you know, let Henry Cavill make the role his own. Um, or like what they did with Christopher Reeve back in the day, uh, when they first cast him as Superman. They pretty much just let him, you know, let him define the role. Um, Christian Bale as Batman, I mean, he wasn't like the most famous household name imaginable at the time when he got cast for that movie, so it's, uh, he kind of got lost in the character. Of course, the voice was ridiculous, but I don't think that was his fault. I think, I'm pretty sure that was something they didn't post, which, why? But, um, I, I wish they'd gone that route again for Batman, and I just don't, I'm not a huge fan of Ben Affleck being there. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be just... Totally dead fucking wrong. Uh, sometimes it works to cast a really recognizable name as a famous character. Like, Jack Nicholson as the Joker, that's a perfect marriage. Because it's just like, the entire movie, I was just like, yep, this is just Tuesday for Jack. <laughs> no acting here. <laughs> it's just it's just Jack Nicholson in clown makeup. But I think the insanity of the Joker character and um, the eccentric nature of Jack Nicholson kind of complemented each other. So I think that's why that one worked. Um, but I don't know, just Ben Affleck as Batman, I, I just don't see that working, but again, I could be dead wrong. It was a good episode, I'll, I'll give them that, but, uh, was it a good move in the long run? Personally, I think Family Guy is a show that needed to be cancelled years ago, I think it ran out of steam. Um, uh, and part of me, there's that part of me that thinks that Seth MacFarlane feels the exact same way, and I just kind of have it in the back of my mind that he did this on purpose just to kind of kill the show, give it its big jumping the shark moment, and then uh, just, you know, just he can finally be done with the show. He'll have an excuse to end it. Um, I've Will Brian stay dead? I've already speculated that they're going to do a Stewie and Brian Road to Heaven or Road to the Afterlife episode, so don't be surprised if that comes up the pike soon, but... Um, I don't know. I, I like. I don't know uh, how it'll affect the show long term or anything like that. Because personally, I barely watched Family Guy in the last few years because I just think, uh, you know, it's much like The Simpsons. The show got old, and I think it's time for the show to end, regardless of whether they. And I would feel that way whether they killed Brian or not. So I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question to. But um, I, I'll be honest. I didn't like the new dog that they put in his place. I was it, it, that was a bit jarring, and I don't think he really. Uh, came off all that well, but, you know, again, I, I guess that's up to the Family Guy fans to decide. I know that, uh, I've heard that petitions have already started up, and all I can think about is, like, you know, when I was a kid, 
it took some serious, you know, uh, fan kitty rage to bring Optimus Prime back from the dead. So, you know, if they sign enough petitions and do whatever they want, you know, maybe Brian could come back one day. Uh, who knows? Yes, I did. And I graduated, too. Go me! I'm not exactly sure. You'd have to ask God on that one. Um, but even this current run that they're on, I just kind of feel like... I feel like they're going to have another fall. I, I don't know. It just feels like it's just in the making. Because um, they haven't really beat anybody that good. They beat us twice, and we suck. They beat, they barely beat the Raiders at home, and the Raiders are terrible. Um, they beat Philly. Uh, you know, Beating an NFC East team means nothing because the whole division sucks. Why not? It's like they're, Dallas Cowboys are probably the best team in the division. The division just sucks. Um, they're just mediocre. Uh, and everybody else is... Well, I mean, Eagles have been decent lately. But, um, yeah, I don't think they've really beaten anybody of any kind of major consequence. So I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to... You know, they get into the playoffs and, you know, you put them up against Seattle or... Um, New Orleans or uh, one of you know one of the really good teams. I just don't see them mashing up. But who knows? I could be wrong. Maybe this will be Tony's year. I've never seen her act, so I can't really comment on her acting abilities. Uh, maybe she went in there and had a really good audition. I don't know. Um, what I will say, though, is that she does not look the part at all whatsoever. When I picture Wonder Woman, I picture, like, a warrior, like someone who's built to look tough. Um, somebody like Lucy Lawless was. Um, you know, obviously very beautiful, and, you know, the looks are going to be part of selling Wonder Woman, but um, somebody who looks tough and has a commanding presence and who looks like she's built, like, built for fighting. Uh, somebody like Lucy Lawless was when she was Xena or... Um, whoever it was that played Sif in the Thor movies, and, uh, whoever it was that played Zod's, uh, hench, you know, top, uh, top lady in Man of Steel, I mean, somebody, I picture Wonder Woman looking something like that, just looking kind of very athletic, built, and muscular, while also still looking beautiful, obviously, and this girl, she looks as skinny as a rail, I mean, she looks like I could, like, you know, go like, and she would just fall over, um, she doesn't have, like, that image of toughness that I would associate with Wonder Woman. Uh, again, maybe she went in there and just had a really good audition. I don't know. And maybe she'll bulk up for the role, and I think she needs to bulk up for the role, because she does not look the least bit intimidating, uh, at least based on what I've seen. But, you know, I'm not... The more I'm hearing about this Batman-Superman you know, movie that they want to do, I, I'm, the less excited I get for it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not too hopeful that they're going to do Wonder Woman right, which is a shame because Wonder Woman, to me, is, you know, the, the ideal female superhero, and she deserves to be done justice. So hopefully they do when movie time rolls around. And uh, But unfortunately, I, my hopes aren't very high.